through science. The human mind is used in order to come to understand the material world and to harness its resources for the service of uh, civilization. Similarly, you have to have a parallel system of knowledge that gives you values, because otherwise you will use these capacities to destroy yourself, to destroy your future, to destroy happiness. And religion has always been the source of values for humankind. We are embarking on a new stage or a new cycle in the spiritual development of humankind. Humanity is moving forward. It has moved through stages of infancy, childhood, and we are in this turbulent adolescence now. And if you look around the world, it's very obvious that we're in a turbulent adolescence. So, and, and we will head towards adulthood, that maturity of adulthood. The key principle of the Baha'i faith, at least in my understanding, <laughs> is really unity. Starting maybe with the, this idea that um, all of the people of the world are actually one people, one human race. When I look at the world around us, I think about how fragmented it is. And I think about um, how uh, different forces that do not have the best interests of human beings in their hearts um, are manipulating us. And I think that we really need to develop a unifying vision. I became aware of the Baha'i faith when I was about 16 years old. I had a strong kind of mystical interest, you know, just on the fundamental big questions. Why are we here? Why does something exist instead of nothing? You know, what is the purpose of life? So the Baha'is don't see the Baha'i faith as one religion among many religions. Really, religion is one unfolding process. There's one God, one creator, and one human race. So my dad discovered the faith in Togo a little bit before uh, coming in Quebec to uh, complete his university studies. And my mom uh, discovered the faith as well uh, in university here in Montreal. Being quite a logical person, what resonated the most with me were the teachings for the world, for the, the way to organize world, the world and society. From age to age, God sent a new um, great educator to guide humanity. In the same way that a very polished mirror will reflect the light of the sun in a very perfect way, while well, those manifestations of God, our great educator, may be li likened to those very perfect mirrors. Um, and so we could say that they are God, or that they are reflection of God, it doesn't really matter. But the key idea is that this is the light of God they are reflecting to us. It may help us to compare it to the schooling experience of a child. In grade one, the child will have a given teacher and they'll learn things adapted to their capacity at that age. When they move on to grade two, the teacher is not contradicting the essence of what the previous teacher said, but it's a new teacher. And the goal of that new teacher is again to educate and help that child to understand the world around them and to develop their capacity. These different religions are really chapters in a continuing story. They are not in conflict with each other. There may be different social teachings that are at variance because of the needs of and the requirements of the time in which those messages were delivered, but that at their core, they are in agreement with each other. They are in complete harmony, and that in fact, it's one story one faith. There was an expectancy in 1844 on the part of people who were awaiting the next installment, people who were awaiting the return of the promised Qa'im in Shiite Islam. 
Um, there was also an expectation around the same time that Christ would return. The Bab is one of the three central figures of the Baha'i faith. So the role of the Bab in the history of the Baha'i faith is comparable and similar in some ways to the role of John the Baptist in the history of Christianity, where you had a figure who came prior to Christ to announce the coming of a messenger of God. The Bab's mission was very short. So he, he declared his mission in the spring of 1844, and he himself was arrested uh, eventually and executed in 1850. The established structures, both the governmental structures and the clerical structures, began to be very, very worried about these first followers. They began to torture them, to imprison them, to put them to death. And the estimates are that some 20,000 of these early followers were either executed or killed by mobs in various grisly ways. But it didn't stop the momentum. What he said was that his own mission had been to prepare the population for one greater than himself, for the promised one of all the religions who would come to fulfill these promises that had been made, and that, that he was very, very near. And one of these followers was um, a, a Persian who has come to be known uh, by history uh, as Baha'u'llah, which means the glory of God. His father had been in the court of the Shah and had occupied a position of great power. And when Baha'u'llah was a young man, Baha'u'llah had been offered that same appointment at the court, which would have given him power, wealth, and so on. It would have built on everything that his family had. Baha'u'llah said no, his, his mission was something else. Baha'u'llah was thrown into prison in this place called the Black Pit, the Sia Chal in Tehran. So that was his first imprisonment. And this pit was a, f a cistern uh, below the city that was damp, it was filled with vermin, it was infested, it was, it was the most loathsome place that you could possibly imagine. These men were taken out and they were executed in different batches, I guess you could say, on a regular basis, day after day after day. There was some hesitation with the execution of Baha'u'llah because he came from a noble family. So he was imprisoned in this black pit for some time. And then the authorities decided, we will exile him. So they exiled him and his family and, his, and some of his followers to Baghdad. And then in the spring of 1863, he announced to the world that he was the promised one of whom the Bob had spoken. He was exiled then further away to the worst possible place in the Ottoman Empire, uh, this place called Akka. And it had been known as a penal colony with the worst conditions. So it was a place where the worst of the, of the murderers and the, the political prisoners were incarcerated in the, in the Ottoman Empire. The cliche was that um, a bird flying over Akka would drop dead of the stench. Why was Baha'u'llah exiled there? Um, because they felt that it was so remote that his message would never reach anybody. He would either die of disease within the penal colony itself, or he would perhaps be murdered by another prisoner there, or he would simply fall into obscurity. He would die there and he would be forgotten. This prisoner who had no temporal power whatsoever, he had the audacity, I guess you could say, to address Kaiser Wilhelm the Shah of Iran, the Sultan of Turkey, all of the leaders of the day. And he didn't write to them to ask them for relief from the terrible conditions that he was enduring. He wrote to them to admonish them about how to govern. He wrote to them to urge them to recognize the message that he was bringing about how they should resist corruption, how the Sultan of Turkey should not surround himself with corrupt ministers and leave governance into their hands while he led a life of luxury, about how they should look after the poor, how they should resist building up armaments and 
taxing their subjects exorbitantly in order to finance the lifestyles that were so lavish. It was not a gentle tone. It was a tone of, I guess you could say, command. Napoleon said, if this is God, then I am two gods. Only Queen Victoria said, if it is of God, it will endure. But you think about what happened to those governments within a number of years after this admonition had been delivered to them. The Tsar of Russia was gone. Napoleon was gone. All of these different leaders had disappeared into the dust of history, and Baha'u'llah's revelation did not disappear into obscurity. Humanity, as a general rule, as a, as a body will gradually become aware of this figure who appeared in the middle years of the 19th century, who said things that were centuries ahead of his time. I mean, even something like predicting the discovery of forces in nature that could cause the contamination of the whole planet. Even at that relatively low level, to say nothing about the oneness of race, the need for world government, the idea for example, that until women are equal, equal to men, not only do we not draw on the whole of uh, so society's resources, but we don't even understand economic challenges because we're only looking at them through the eyes of men. Women are much more oriented toward family, society, and so on. The Bab and Baha'u'llah occupy a station known as Manifestations of God, and this is the same station that Jesus Christ had and Muhammad and Moses and other major figures in religious history, where we see them as representatives, mouthpieces of God on earth, that they're like perfect mirrors that reflect to us the attributes and qualities of God. And in many ways, they're just unapproachably glorious, they're inconceivable, really, what the, the nature of their being. And their word is a creative word, and that's why the sacred scriptures of the world have such a transformative impact on the human heart. We don't display images of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, and it's really a measure of the sacredness with which we treat those images of the manifestations of God. The third central figure in the founding of the Baha'i Faith was Abdul Baha, who was the son of, of Baha'u'llah. I grew up in uh, Prince Edward Island, and uh, when I was a little girl, there was another girl in my class. I remember going over to her, her house, and I was transfixed by this picture in the front hall of the house. And I remember staring at this picture and turning around and saying to her, you have a wonderful grandfather in this family. I didn't know who the picture was of. It wasn't until many years later when I saw the picture of Abdul Baha that I realized that, that was who it was. Now, the station of Abdul Baha is, is quite different. Abdul Baha is not a manifestation of God, but he was raised up by Baha'u'llah and trained by Baha'u'llah, which means that we can turn to Abdul Baha as an example of what it means to live a Baha'i life. I work as a secondary high school teacher. When I was about 16 or 17 years old, I became really enraged about the racism that I was experiencing. I think in the world today, there are some very superficial understandings of what unity is. Unity is everyone wearing the same t-shirt and holding hands, but it isn't. I see students from all different cultures, but they still sit in their different groups. There's a white girls to the side, native students to the other side, the mixed browns are together. <laughs> And I call them on it because they think that by being in the same room, we've achieved something, and that's the final goal. So this unifying vision that the Baha'i Faith brings allows communities to be built around different activities where cultures are brought in and they're celebrated. In the Baha'i community, there are educational activities that we're offering to the wider community. The children's class program is a global endeavor for everyone to participate in. The materials that we're using are the same ones that are being used in Zimbabwe, in Cambodia, in China. Every sunny hot day. From the very beginning, we share with them this vision that once they finish the children's class program, 
they will go on to become junior youth. And once they finish that program, they'll come back and be children's class teachers themselves. So it's a process that continues to grow. In our nicest voices, sitting up straight and tall, we're speaking with our Creator. Are you ready, Serena? It begins with prayer. And for many people, that might be something that is unfamiliar or maybe something they're quite hesitant about. What does it mean to get a group of children together to pray? It's a really beautiful thing to see. Son of Spirit, my first counsel is this, possess a pure, kindly, and radiant heart. I'm Passion, and I'm eight and a half and turning uh, nine October 31st. My name is Asam Six. I'm turning seven December eight. Uh, the prayers you get to yeah. sing and uh, you get to do the prayers that you like. Yeah, it makes me feel like I'm alive. You know, we have these ingrained prejudices that have influenced our social structures, our institutions, our political structures. Prejudices of skin color, of ethnicity, of culture, of educational level, what have you that these prejudices have to be eliminated. So one of the quotes from the Baha'i Faith is, the earth is one country and mankind its citizens. This is very much reflected in the Aboriginal community. So I think this is one of the things in our community that we can bring to the world, this understanding that we're global citizens. We have begun some study circles on Morley Reservation. They consist of a group of youth and they really think and consult about the spiritual needs of their communities. O son of being, with the hands of power I made thee, and with the fingers of strength I created thee, and within thee I have placed the essence of my light. They focus on Baha'i principles and teachings. So they are able to work with the younger children in the community and the junior youth. For the children's classes, they focus specifically on virtues such as unity, generosity, truthfulness. And anyone of any culture, any religion can relate to these concepts. It helps me open up. It offers the chance to have my voice heard. I was hoping and I was looking for something, something I could progress with spiritually and mentally, emotionally as well. Learning some of these lessons, I feel connected with other cultures because it introduces universal ideas to sort of become fond with the differences. Spirituality, Without it, I think we're just birds with wings and no feathers. Economic problems in the world, extremes of poverty and suffering and, materi and material um, destitution, that those are essentially spiritual problems at the core. The world has enough wealth for all of humanity to live just fine. All of the world's resources belong to the whole of humankind. All these things belong to everybody. People can't think of them that way. They, because of course, all of the nationalistic and religious and, and uh, racial divisions and prejudices that they have. <laughs> so when I was 15 years old, I started to go to Morley and uh, my mom would accompany me. When she would tell them her story, they could relate to it so well. And they were like, that's our story. You know, it's, it's someone who is um, oppressed and who's faced difficulty talking to another person who's been extremely oppressed. سال 1985, the class of و اسم من رو صدا کرد گفت سمیعی شما به علت بهایی بودن و تبلیغ دیانت بهایی از دبیرستان اخراج هستیم 
منم یه دانش آموز کلاس 11 بودم 17 سالم بود و این مسئله برای من خیلی سنگین بود وقتی که بچه ها متوجه این مسئله شدن که من به خاطر باهاییت از دبیرستان اخراج شدم هم همه ایجاد شد و همه اعتراض کردن معلم تعلیمات دینی ما به بچه ها گفت ساکت باشین من راجع به دیانت بهایی برای شما تعریف بکنم شروع کرد یک سری تهمت ها و افتراعاتی رو راجع به دیانت بهایی زدن که معلم دینی خشمگین شد از بچه ها پرسید که داخل این کلاس چند نفر بهایی هستند بهایی ها بلند شدند که چهار نفر بودیم مدیر مدرسه پرونده های ما رو آماده کرد و ما رو از دبیرستان اخراج کرد The persecution began, of course, virtually the first day that the faith began in 1844. You'd wonder, well, why were the Mullahs so worried about the Baha'is? They were worried about the Baha'is because they realized that their day was over completely if the Baha'i faith ever began to seriously spread. If, in fact, we've come to an age where you no longer need clergy, you don't need some clergyman to tell you how to think or to believe and so on. If this uh, whole new approach to learning had, had been accepted in Iran, there was no future for the Mullahs. The Baha'is are a worldwide religious faith. In recent weeks in Iran, 16 members of the Baha'is that we know about were hanged. They were executed in spite of an appeal for clemency by President Reagan. Those killed included three teenage girls plus this entire family. They died in Iran for their faith. Yeah, I want, I want to live a life and I want to accomplish things in my life that will really give meaning to what the Baha'is in Iran are going through. And I know that their difficulties are for us to be able to share the message of Baha'u'llah with the world. These youth that I'm friends with now are the same youth that I've read about in Baha'i history. In 1844, when the Bab declared his mission, the first people that believed in the Bab were, were youth themselves. Because when you are a youth, you have uh, the desire to investigate the truth and find out what the truth is. And when you're able to find the truth, you just are set ablaze. I really think that the program for the young people and ce qu'il qu leur a offert en opportunité à travers ce programme-là, tous les apprentissages, que c'est important, puis on, on doit y participer. Alors, moi, je ressens comme j'ai envie de faire partie de ça. Alors, on y va, et puis voilà. Well, I'm Nathaniel, but I just live down the hill that way. Je m'appelle Aris, je viens du Togo, puis j'habite en haut là-bas. Uh, I come, not just because I want to pass time, but also because I develop friendships with the people in the group as well. I didn't know Harris until two years ago when we first started the group. The way he thinks about it, he brings it into deeper detail than what we would normally go into. Okay, okay. <laughs> Il est moins énergique que moi, j'avoue, mais il réfléchit plus avant de répondre que moi aussi. Donc, on se complète à peu près l'un l'autre. Je suis devenu à la parler. Euh, ouais, je parle beaucoup avec mes parents de ce que je fais dans le groupe. En fait, je parle tout le temps. Si on finit un cahier, bien, on le révise à la maison, puis on essaie de le pratiquer aussi. De répondre parce que je l'utilise à peu près tous les jours, parce que la plupart de ce qu'on fait dans le livre, bien, Mohamed essaie de nous faire faire dans la vraie vie aussi. Mais j'ai une question. Quand j'étais jeune adolescent, la justice était, était très importante pour moi. Puis c'est ce qui m'a amené à choisir la carrière de policier. Bon, ce que je pense, c'est euh, une structure très rigide, le système de justice comme on a présentement. C'est peut-être pas tout à fait un système de justice, c'est un système de droit.
Et puis à chaque fois que j'étais à la recherche ou je discutais avec des pairs ou avec des gens qui sont connexes à mon milieu de travail, que ce soit des avocats ou des intervenants sociaux, etc., à chaque fois, je pouvais sentir que les gens étaient désireux de trouver des solutions. Et puis à chaque fois, c'était un peu comme le jello. Ça, 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 ça nous échappe entre les doigts. Là. Après quelques années, je me suis rendu compte que c'était pas tout à fait l'idéal de la justice que j'étais à la recherche. Je connaissais un, des gens dans la communauté ici qui étaient euh, de la communauté Bahi, donc je me suis dit, bon, est-ce que je pourrais aller les voir puis en parler ensemble? Puis voilà, ça a commencé comme ça pour moi. Alors après une année, j'ai laissé mes peurs tomber et puis j'ai sauté. Justice is a faculty of the human soul. Justice is a way that you discern truth. And Baha'u'llah says, by its aid, you shall see with your own eyes and not through the eyes of others. And you will know by your own knowledge and not through the knowledge of your neighbor. So it's the ability of each soul to look at things and be truthful and state things as they are and not be swayed by prejudices. And I think that's, that as a spiritual quality, that's the foundation where justice begins in interhuman, interpersonal relations. And then gradually in the relations between communities and institutions and all the way up to the global level. Institutions are interesting because if you look at the world around us, you think about government, right, as an institution. You would think, how many people in the world, living anywhere in the world, would say, I love my government? We need to be louder. You know, most of us will say, well, I tolerate the government, or, you know, well, I didn't vote for them, or something like that. So not a sense of love for government, but you would find that in the Baha'i community, there is a sense of love for these institutions that have been established by Baha'u'llah. And maybe that's part of it, is that Baha'u'llah established these, these institutions, that he left a blueprint for how each one of these institutions should be constituted. Generally, in past religious dispensations, once the founder passed away, the followers had to figure things out in terms of how they would create religious institutions to carry on the legacy and the teachings. In this case, Baha'u'llah outlined a, what we call the Baha'i administrative order. And it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating system of, of governance because in the Baha'i faith, there is no such thing as individual leaders. There's collective bodies of consultation. And these are elected bodies at the local level, at the national level, and at the international level. And it's more than 100,000 towns and cities and other localities around the world that have organized Baha'i communities. So local spiritual assemblies are elected without any candidature, hence without any cam campaigning either. We give a responsibility to each individual to really know the members of their community. If we don't know what are the qualities of, the, of our fellow members, we may only go for the people we know the most, or, which is not what we want. We don't want to just vote for our friends or vote for the most people that talk the most or those kind of things, which might appear in other settings, right? Probably we would say anybody who, who puts himself or herself forward, you know, saying, I'm great, I'm, I will be the best person, somebody that we would not vote for because Baha'u'llah says that the people that we seek to elect to these institutions are people who are selfless, that they are not seeking personal gain, but that they are seeking to serve humanity. We have this process of average people being elected and consulting together. Really, it's each individual's responsibility to look at the holy writings, read them, study them, try to understand them to the best of their ability, and strive to apply them in their life without the pressure of pleasing figure, other figures of authorities. Baha'u'llah doesn't belong to the Baha'is. He's not. Uh... You know, that's always the mistake that religion made in the past. They sort of took religion and put it in a little box and labeled it, and then the clergy ran the whole thing, and, and uh, it was theirs, and it distinguished them from everybody else. Well, we know that's not reality. We know that Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah's teachings are wide open for the whole of humankind. 
There's one system of knowledge, which we call science. We try to penetrate the conditions of the universe. We try to um, harness the resources of the universe to the service of the evolution of society and so on. That's what science does and heals problems and so on. But along with it, you have to have a value system and nobody in all human history has ever been able to produce value systems that become universally acceptable and hugely creative and productive, except religion. It can be, and it usually has been corrupted eventually, and all kinds of crimes committed in his name doesn't change the fact that man cannot live without values. And today, the values have to be values that can work with science for the evolution of uh, united man humankind. There's a concept of the harmony of science and religion. And this is a very profound theme that a lot of people are speaking now about. What is the relationship of faith and reason? And in the Baha'i perspective, these are two faculties of the human soul. These are twin faculties, the two most powerful agencies through which humanity can discover reality. Just because I was raised in a Baha'i family, that's the experience of a lot of people, is they'll be raised in a certain tradition or a certain belief system or a certain philosophy, and then that's it. It's by rote, it's, it's traditional, it's what you're supposed to do. And so they just kind of continue on that path unquestioningly forever. I went and kind of went my own path off into the distance, <laughs> away from, away from the kind of by way of life to some degree. I still had it in my heart, but um, but I just had to just see what was out in the world, and I did. And all it really did was reconfirm my belief, and and it reconfirmed the pure logic and reason of it. I'm not saying my life is easy now, and it's full of challenge and difficulty, because that's, I think, built into the fabric of our lives, apparently. <laughs> In the Baha'i writings, it says, Obey my commandments for the love of my beauty. And what's really cool about that is, if you look at a tree or an eagle or any of the amazing, beautiful things in nature, they all obey nature's law perfectly into the letter. An eagle soars. A tree is mighty and reaches to the heavens. You know, all of these examples. A whale plunges in the ocean. They have no choice but to observe the commandments of nature and therefore the commandments of our creator to the law and to the letter. But human beings do have a choice. We have that free will. And if we choose to do that, then we live beautiful lives in harmony with nature. This Baha'i House of Worship here in Wilmette, Illinois, on the shores of Lake Michigan, is the oldest existing Baha'i House of Worship. And it's one of seven continental houses of worship. There's an eighth one under construction right now in Santiago, Chile. And when you have a temple that's open in all directions, that allows people to enter and to exit in all directions, that symbolizes that people are welcome from all directions, from all cultures, from all faiths, from all backgrounds. When I was in school, grade one, I had this marvelous art teacher, Mrs. McKay. So I graduated from grade six with this unrequited love for Mrs. McKay in my heart. When I came back from my first year at university, several of my friends were investigating the Baha'i faith. One of them was sending me pamphlets. I read them and I, I thought, you know, okay, that's good, but why does the world need another religion? Ha! And I threw the pamphlets in the garbage. I was hanging out with my friends and somebody said, oh, let's go to so-and-so's house. And uh, we all jumped in cars and we went to this, this woman's house. And there, sitting in a chair at the far end of the room, was Mrs. McKay. And my heart stopped because I still had this love for her in my heart. And as we were sitting down, uh, Mrs. McKay said, Now, before we continue the conversation, I think it would be really good if each of us said a prayer. 
I thought, okay, you're, you know, your mother brought you up, right? You're going to be polite and, and you'll, you'll last through this and then you're, then you're out of here. So I began flipping through this prayer book. And then I got to this prayer and I, I scanned it, I looked at it, and I remember the thought that ran through my head at the time, which was, okay, this one looks harmless enough. And so I began to say the prayer aloud. And before I got to the end of the first sentence of the prayer, I realized that if I walked away from it, I would regret it for the rest of my life. The spiritual discipline of prayer, of study of the writings, morning and evening, has a transformative effect on the individual. And the more that we do this, the more that we imbibe this life-giving water of revelation, the more it affects the way that we behave, the way that we react, the way that we think in our daily lives. Whether it's the words of Christ, or the words of Muhammad, or the words of Baha'u'llah, they touch the deepest layers of human identity and motivation. And we really need to touch that source every day and be fed and nourished from that. So in the Baha'i Faith, we believe in daily prayer and daily immersion into this ocean of, of words. welcome to say prayers as we see fit, to send up our own little personal pleas. But Baha'u'llah has given us the words of these prayers that are the most befitting language with which to engage in this conversation with God. The phrases that he has given in these prayers have come back to me. They have become part of of even unconscious thought, I think. They come up to me perhaps in moments of despair or in moments when I am being tested. They're like a compass for me, a compass for my soul. So Baha'u'llah said the highest form of worship is any work that's carried out in the spirit of service. So your profession, your day-to-day -day work that you do, if you're doing it in a spirit of service to humanity, and of selfless service, that is the highest form of worship for Baha'is. It's much better than time spent, you know, in isolation or, or um, reading uh, endlessly, you know, so you need to put that into practice. Spirituality is not this airy-fairy thing, and it's certainly not magic. It's verifiable results in a person's life. There's uh, a really beautiful quote by Baha'u'llah that says, the divine physician hath his finger on the pulse of mankind. He, per he perceiveth the disease, he sees what's wrong with the world, and in his unerring wisdom prescribeth the remedy. And then he says, the remedy the world needeth in its present day affliction can never be the same as that which a subsequent age may require. Now the specific problem for the world is, who cares what your border is? Who cares you know, what that person or their family did to you two generations ago? Because that will just go on forever. The problem is unity, love of one's neighbor, and, and understanding that they're actually your brother. Many people, when they are presented with the concept of world peace, will think of it as a, as a utopian, almost a cliche, you know, something that's unattainable, and the history of humanity shows that wars and conflicts will always be a part of, of human nature. That's the common conception. But if you take an evolutionary look at that and see that actually periods of peace and prosperity and development have been established in different parts of the world, Mankind's religious history is a history of, of, a, of religion as one of the drivers of the advancement of civilization. So you have you know, the, the, the Christian faith and Islam and Buddhism, when they entered human history and then you had a flowering of civilization around those messages. And the Baha'i vision is that now that process is, is ready to happen really at a global level. And the legacy of the 20th century is really the human race coming to grips with the fact that it is one people inhabiting one planet.
Gradually, throughout the 20th century, in each one of these three areas, nation, race, and gender, humanity had crossed a threshold that it would never be able to go back. Lots of societies still keep women in a sort of second place, but respectable people will no longer be listened to by anybody if they start arguing that women are fundamentally inferior to men. It doesn't matter whether some people don't like it or not or don't accept it, there will always be some people who, who will be years behind or decades behind. Only in one prejudice, of all the prejudices that, that are afflicting mankind, there's only one in which even that threshold of recognizing reality hasn't been crossed, and that's religion. Baha'u'llah wrote these tablets to the kings and the rulers of the world in the late 19th century, and no one listened to him. So that opportunity to establish the most great peace passed. It is the statement of Baha'u'llah that peace is inevitable. So the question that I have is how long and, and thorny will that path be till we get there? It behoveth every man to blot out the trace of every idle word from the tablet of his heart and to gaze with an open and unbiased mind on the signs of his revelation, the proofs of his mission, and the tokens of his glory. It's interesting how your life turns out. I would never have imagined marrying a white man in my life. Not that I wasn't attracted to them or that I didn't have white friends, but it, at the time growing up, I didn't see enough examples around me or, or at all in the media or in the people in our communities. But then the creator placed this man before me and it's the best thing for me because it constantly forces me to think about the other side. My father was a refugee from East Prussia. He left Germany as a child right after the Second World War and lost all his family and was really uh, uprooted. And then he became a diplomat for the U.S. government. And so as I was growing up, we moved all over the world. I grew up in South America, Central America, and in Africa. And so by the time I reached my teens, I really had um, a sense of dislocation and not a clear sense of, of identity or where I belong. I was born in Costa Rica. I was American because I had American citizenship, but I had never lived in the United States. And so I was really needing a, a global identity, an identity that would honor the fact that I was a human being first and foremost before being of any particular nationality or background. So the first thing I heard about the Baha'i Faith was a saying of Baha'u'llah in his writings where he says, the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. And I felt like, well, here's a group of people that will accept me as I am. Um, maybe I can say that again without getting emotional about it. No matter who I am, no matter what my level of education, no matter where I live in the world, no matter what my cultural background, what language I speak, what ethnic background I come from, I have something to contribute to the world. Even a little life somewhere has a, a benefit to the world. It's got all